This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now I am so excited for today's guest because I will be talking to Nancy Ferguson. Um, Nancy uh, was the wife of Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo. They had a side group called uh, Visiting Kids. And I can't wait to talk today. They had a hit on MTV called Trillobites. But she's also been in so many great cult movies. Oh my god, so many. Um, she was in Fatal Games celebrating its 40th anniversary. She'll be my fourth guest uh, from the movie. Um, Hollywood Zap, uh, The Wizard of Speed and Time, Rockula. She was on David Lynch's short-lived series, On the Air, which was not never on my radar, and I've seen clips of it on YouTube. It looks like it was pretty damn funny. I mean, the clips are funny, but, like, the show overall must have been funny. She was in Phil Collins' I Wish It Would Rain Down. She was in Mystery Men, and uh, she's a documentary uh, filmmaker, producer. She made a, um, a documentary about Robert Williams, the artist, called Mr. Bitchin', and... Um, she also produced a uh, movie Bill Rabain wrote, another guest of mine, Christmas at Rosemont. And it's going to be a great conversation today. She is a multi-talented lady, you know, musician, actress, filmmaker, and she's part of, you know, that time in, in Hollywood, you know, when people could be artists and be subversive. And I am really looking forward to this conversation today. So yeah, here is my interview with Nancy Ferguson. Hey Nancy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Hi Tommy. Hi. Uh, this is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Let's just have some fun. Absolutely. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Oh, that is hysterical. I was actually um, a terminally shy child. Uh -huh. um, I basically uh, started out um, living uh, mostly, <laughs> primarily, in uh, my mom's closet, you know, and just they had a tiny little window behind her clothes and mm -hmm. I was on top of a bunch of blankets and just sort of lived in my own imagination. So I guess in that regard, it may have started because my uh, imagination um, was so active, but um, I didn't really um, come into that until... You know, I, I, I actually used to draw, and I did a lot of artwork and made a lot of art projects, and so I got a degree in art, mm -hmm. um, and then I went into performance art, and so from there I sort of was doing more avant-garde theater and experimental theater and kind of crossing over my performance art, and then I got found by the entertainment industry and then I started studying actually acting and fell in love with it and I did have a teacher and I did have a dance background too in college so and I, mm -hmm. I was sort of doing a lot of multimedia art so and I did have a teacher in college that um, where his class was called drama in 3D and drama in 4D where I did see that I had that um love of performing so a little bit in high school because I was a cheerleader and then a little bit in um, performing things that we did in plays and things like that but it really kind of came as a performance artist and then segued into an acting career wow and did you uh, did you love music early on um, yes I, who doesn't love music but I always <laughs> did love music <laughs> but I was <laughs> I might need to drink a little water. <laughs> um, I did always love music. Yeah, can you, do you remember the first album you ever bought with your own money? Oh, boy. Um, well, I do know the first concert I went to. Oh, what was that? Um, I went to see at the Greek theater, um, Crosby, Sills, and Nash. And uh. at the time... Um, 
Neil Young had just joined, so was Crosby, Still, Nash, and Young. Right. You know, that was like an added. And Joni Mitchell opened. Wow. So, wow. So that was, you know, a life-changing experience. Uh, did you see her at the Grammys the other night? Yes. Oh, my that, God. I was. I have to admit, I was crying. <laughs> yeah, she's a walking miracle, I'll tell you. A walking miracle. And I, I have, I have been able to uh, throughout the years. I've met her quite a few times and spent some time with her, um, and every time it's an honor and so, um, so fun to be in her presence at any moment. So I have had that uh, great privilege. Oh, that is wonderful. So you're, you're born and raised in LA. Since I was two and a half. Okay, where'd you come from? So I was born in, born in uh, Bayshore, Long Island. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I came to, uh, yeah, came to Los Angeles at two and a half with my parents and my older brother. Mm-hmm. Wow. So um, when you're getting into, like, performance art and everything, would you, like, go to the, 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 the comedy clubs and, like, work out the material? No, I, I got a degree um, at San Diego State University, and so I started my performance art more, um, more in, uh, you know, on the college campus, and uh, we would, like, rent venues, or we would do things out in the street, or, um, yeah, it was very much a little bit more grassroots. I, I've never... Um, I, you know, there were some crossover venues here in Los Angeles when I, mm-hmm. you know, moved back to Los Angeles. There was the Lassa Club that played music and did performance art, and um, and then there was yeah. So, but I never, I never saw myself as uh, being on a comedy stage. It was it was funny because I actually didn't know I was funny mm-hmm. until um, I would be doing. In acting classes, I would be doing these dramatic scenes with very serious intentions, and all of a sudden, people would be laughing. <laughs> I was like, oh, "What's funny?" <laughs> you know. So Most- I, you know, my my comedy came out of myself, and it wasn't like an, ever an intention to be funny. So, um, so it was. I thought I thought it was kind of a perfect my all-time, one of my all-time favorite jobs and a sort of a perfect blend of things within myself was the role of Ruth Trueworthy in the David Lynch series on the air. Because, you know, to do a David Lynch comedy and to be a, on a television series that yeah. was a David Lynch series was just sort of the ultimate culmination of who I was in terms of merging art and commerce and commerciality in for me, you know, like I, yeah. it was an AB, it was way ahead of its time in terms there wasn't any HBO or Showtime, so it was this ABC series, you know, where you were going to a lot and having a parking spot and doing, you know, a, a seven episodes, and yet you're working with one of the greatest artists of all time and someone that, if you would ask me when I was acting, if there was a director I'd want to work with, I would totally say David Litch. So it was a dream come true. And with all, an extraordinary cast that um, we, you know, that mm-hmm. I was able to work with. So that was that was definitely a highlight job, and I feel like that was a merging of my art background, and my performance art background, with my acting career. Did Donna Kaufman introduce you to Mark? Did Donna Kaufman introduce me to Mark? No. Um, why, why did you think that? <laughs> she she told me last night. She's like, I introduced her to Mark Mothersbaugh. <laughs> um, uh, no. <laughs> I'm just curious to hear Donna's story. At what moment did she meet me? <laughs> did she introduce me to Mark? Where and when was that? I'm curious. I don't know. It was a brief Facebook comment she made last night. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, no, I, um, okay, so I met Mark the first time. Um, I, so this Lhasa Club, I told you, this place where I performed a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I was there seeing, I believe, the band um, 
the Fibonacci's, an, an L.A. artsy band at the time. And the very first moment I met Mark for a second was um, he was standing behind me, and I, and I was doing performance art at the time, and my partner, Oscar Met was a huge Devo fan, mm -hmm. and I, he was standing behind me, and I just sort of said, Ohio, <laughs> Ohio, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> and I just said something and smiled or whatever, and that was our first moment together, but I guess he told me that, that the minute he saw me, he fell in love with me. So then the next time I saw him, I was out doing the club circuit it was Halloween weekend like with my flyer for my band visiting kids and I was wearing a blonde wig and very 60s outfit like yeah. a bob blonde with dark sunglasses and I saw Mark um he was with Lorraine Newman at the time and I sort you know and I sort of saw him and I said um, oh, hi, okay, whatever. <laughs> and he was like, Patty, I guess, like, Patty Duke, and we had, I gave him yeah. a poster to my band, and I he took off my, I said, oh, actually, you know, I'm like a fan of yours, and then I, I had taken off my sunglasses or whatever, and he goes, well, I'm actually a fan of yours, and I was like, really? And so um, that was the second moment, and then he showed up at the, uh, at the uh, sound check mm -hmm. for our concert that was on Halloween night, and that was the first time that we uh, went on a date. Everyone's like, Nancy, Mark Motherspot's here to see you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then we sort of went, I know, you know, we sort of went in between sound check and the show, mm -hmm. went to see a common friend of ours that was performing at the China Club called his name was Spaz Attack, and uh, then I almost, he, we were in his his red uh, sports car, it was a 190 SL, 1958 Mercedes, and ran out of gas, and I had to, like, literally run to my show, and then, you know, throw on my outfit, and get, if all the kids, you know, I had little kids in my band, and throw, throw, get everyone together and go on stage, and he said, <laughs> when he saw me on stage, then he knew for sure, she's the one. <laughs> <laughs> so so Devo was going by that point when you met him. Oh yeah, so that was in 1983. Oh okay, that was way after. Yeah, I I'm a huge Devo fan. You know, I tried to go see them in San Francisco last November on the farewell tour, but it was sold out before I could even, you know, make the attempt. Um yeah, those first three records, oh god, are just fucking fantastic. They are just groundbreaking in both new wave and punk. Incre I know, incredible. And, and, and you know, I, I, saw, I saw them perform so many times, not not recently, but so many times, and they're yeah. live. So have you ever seen them live? Never, never got to. Yeah, their live show is definitely where their energy is maximum. You know, the combination mm -hmm. of their... They, too, are artists, Jerry and Mark, that merged music and art and that music just was an expression of being an artist and what they had to say and so that you're definitely seeing artists performing music with you know very sophisticated ideas in their songs yet you know at this vibrant choreography and visual and song you know everything comes together you know in just a fantastic way so it's definitely an experience and I think I asked him I said so is this really a farewell tour and he said well I don't know I think they're just saying that so you never know you still may get another chance I think uh, the the uh, the farewell tour moniker is just a, a way to get people to come. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like I think there's been so many people where it's like the last time you're gonna see Cher or Elton John or Kiss. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, and everybody then is like, oh yeah, this is really the last time. Oh no, this is right. so yeah. So he he kind of says, you know, I don't think anything is ever set in stone, as we kind of have learned in our life. Um, that we, you know, we kind of have to go with the flow because at every moment and instant, everything can change. So you, you guys had the Visiting Kids side project. What sparked that idea? So that came, um, uh, I was doing performance art with Oscar Mitt and we were in New York and we, I, I, 
had just previously, I'm trying to think which came first, but, but I think it was the, we saw like a headline in the uh, New York Post that said, visiting kids terrorize home. <laughs> and we're like going, visiting kids, that's a great name for a band. And it was either right before or shortly after, um, there was a couple of kids that I met in my life. Um, one in particular that said, you know, had met me at a party and said, you know, I have a band, um, you know, and I said, oh, really? Well, let me come, you know, let me come see what you have. I went and visited her and she just was singing songs and there was no band. And I said, well, you know, maybe I could put a band together for you and we'll do this. <laughs> and then my, I, you know, I had met this other child that had um, overcome cancer um, at four, she had cancer from two to four, and she Aww. told me her dream, her mom was in a band called Pelican, and um, who I knew and loved, her mom, and she told me she had a dream to be in a band. So I created, I said, okay, we're gonna do this, and so I only was gonna do it as a performance art you know, concept for, I had two songs, one was Who Stole My Barbie Doll Away From Me, and the other was Drop Me Off at the Galleria, and then we got an encore, so we did Drop Me Off at the Galleria again. <laughs> so, so um, and then everybody's like, Nancy, this is incredible, and I, this is incredible. Um, you have to do this more, you have to, you know, develop it. I'm like, oh, okay, so then I started um, developing it, and then when Mark saw it, he thought, you know, you really got to do this. And, uh, you know, I had Bob Mother's Law of Devo back us. At the time, I had really great musicians. There was a member of the Fibonacci. I had um, Dale that was a member of the Oingo Boingo. It was always these really cool nice. musicians that played in very, you know, either popular bands or, you know, L.A. popular bands. And so I had this sort of great um, backup band for these little kids. and. You know, my idea was very pure, so it wasn't like I had Michael Jackson singing. I had real kids, off-key kids, singing their hearts out that I had given them choreography and that our show was, you know, had props and Barbie dolls coming from the ceiling and in that sort of low-tech performance art way where you pull together a show. And so it was really organic and happened very poor, and then even in its development, it happened organically, like uh, Mark Smith was in the band, she was six, Bob's daughter, and we had a song called Nepotism. So, you know, there was, <laughs> yeah. there was uh, it was a lot of fun, and um, yeah, my drummer was the drummer of Sparks, you know, and he ended up playing with Devo, and so yeah. it was so much fun, and it was always a great departure for them to put on their little shorts and bow ties, and and white shirts and knee-high socks and back up these kids and it was artsy and fun and you know we would go into we'd open for Nina Hagen and Cabaret Voltaire and Sparks and all these great bands and we would just go into the dressing rooms of all these rock places or whatever and I'd go well we just need an area for the kids to do homework and <laughs> <laughs> we changed the like there'll be no alcohol and so uh you know, a lot of people wanted me to open. I'm like, no, we have to go on first because the kids have to, like, you know, either 8, 9 o'clock the latest, so we have to be an opening band. We can't headline. So, yeah, so it, it was it was really a wonderful project. Yeah, the, the Trillo Bites music video was so classic. Tell me about making that video. Oh, yeah, so Trillo Bites, um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so Trillo Bites, rock, the great Rocky Shank, um, uh, I had met and I loved his videos. He was he's he is an artist and I felt that they were very special and the way he used cinema, you know, he really did the music videos as just a short piece of film and um so we started working together on the song and just really did it like a short film and did pieces and I funded it all myself and um, that was really a, a joyful project and you know and we ended up playing on MTV and really having kind of a great life been a lot of film festivals and 
A lot of uh, really interesting artists. Rocky always says, you know, because it went on his reel, a lot of really great artists really wanted to work with him because he did that video. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was pretty, that was a, 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 an amazing project. That, that, that song is like Devo combined with the Go-Go's Vacation and Oingo Boingo. It's just a very unique song. I love that. Well, that's, that's interesting you picked that up. So, yes, yeah, because so Mark was producing by then, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, um, and the person that wrote the music at the time, my performance art partner, Oscar Mitt, had, like, those were his influences, like, Sparks and Devo. So, and the Sparks drummer actually wrote that song. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so you picked up on all the uh, right sort of influences. And, and a lot of times when I would get reviewed, they would say it had, like, you know, your little go go's or, you know, or, or other girl bands that they, they thought we were similar to. Yeah, the first movie on your IMDb is Rock and Roll Hotel. I never saw this, but I've I've heard about it. Tell tell me about it. Um, yeah, so you know it's hard to say. Actually, say it's now called Fatal Games, but yeah, uh, it, it had a different name at the time. I can't remember. Oh no, no, no I'm, I'm talking about this movie with Judd Nelson. No, I know, but oh. <laughs> normally Fatal Games, you know, because sometimes the film comes out oh, okay. not the first film, even though it comes out before. Got the, it, got it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was, uh, but but it was in the early days. Yes, Rock and Roll Hotel oh. with Rachel Sweet was, yeah. and um, and yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I had very short, punky hair at the time, so there was like a whole punk feel to me there for that film, and uh, there was a lot of people in that film that were you know, L.A. musicians or artists and performance artists, and it had that whole vibe to it. Yeah, and um, that's probably Judd Nelson's first movie is before The Breakfast Club and Making the Graydon Fandango is probably his first Way movie. Way before, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so there was, yeah, and it had that kind of hip, you know, you know, everybody was sort of kind of like hip and cool in <laughs> feel. Yeah, and Colin Quinn was in it as well. <laughs> right, I know a lot of lot lot of people in that film. I know, and, and you know, it's funny. All these little early films I did, which you just you know you just don't know, end up having this cult status further down the road, which is which is really fun. Yeah, but uh, you're my fourth guest from Fatal Games. I've talked to uh, Spice Williams, Linnea Quigley, and I had Sally Kirkland on last year. Great lady. What What do you remember about doing that movie? Well, so that actually was um, the first film that I, you know, became a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So I I remember that, and uh, you know, I think I was uh, reading. You know, it's funny. I don't see all my work because I'm sort of like oh you know especially coming from this performance art background you know we were back in a time where people didn't have phones and filming everything so you had this experience that you were really doing art for the moment and then it was gone so mm -hmm. if there was two people in front of you that saw it or then it went on the news or if there was a hundred people or a thousand those were the people that saw you perform and then it was God. Most of the time, there was this um, difference than today, where you do anything and it's all, you know, online. You know, your whole life is on film. So, um, what I remember was um, what, what I read about because I was like, we're kind of going, oh yeah, I've got to look up for these movies I did so long ago. Mm -hmm. And they say there was a lot of girls that were <laughs> naked in shower and scenes. Well, I was one of those girls. So, and, yep. and the thing that was interesting, uh, and and working with the other girls, the lead actors, because we were like athletes and had scenes together. You know, obviously had scenes together. But I'll have people that will be watching that movie late at night, and I'll be like naked in a shower, right? And yep. Yep. We just saw you, and I was like, oh yeah. And I remember that there's a whole stigma in the entertainment industry about oh whether you do nudity or not. And because I came from an art background and was actually, a, you know, when I was in college getting my degree, I would model for art classes because it was like an easy way. I'm already in the department. I would just model and make some money. And, you know, we were all like, 
you didn't, I, you didn't really, like think twice about it because it's like part of what you did. You drew naked people. You could be naked. Like we were just very free. So I, you know, it never faced me at all. Like oh yeah, so there's nudity in this. It's like no problem, you know. So um, I remember a lot of those scenes. So we were just, <laughs> definitely there was a lot of naked scenes, and um, you know. It was exciting because that was the movie that um, I then joined this, officially joined the entertainment industry and sort of crossed over from a performance artist starting a trajectory of an acting career. And so I saw like, oh, it's harder to make money um, as a performance artist, but this entertainment industry could help support my art so uh i remember it being that and it, you know and, and also the person that gave me that job was uh christopher mankowitz who yep. um at the time was a very good friend of a jazz musician i was dating john sari mm -hmm. a famous jazz pianist so you could see my music influence too but so it was chris that gave me that job so i very much remember that film yeah, no, you you looked great in there, and um, yeah, it's it, it's funny. Linnea and Sally don't remember much, but Spice, you know, remembers that production shut down for t for a couple of weeks uh, during filming, and you know she played a lesbian in the movie, so she had to kiss a girl on screen, right? Well, but during the uh, the two week the two week shutdown, and this wasn't by design, she converted to Christianity. So when she came back, she couldn't kiss any more girls. <laughs> That is hysterical. Um, yeah. I've met Sally, and I know Sally a little bit. I haven't seen her in a while. She's a lovely person. I did not know that part, but I do have Oh, no, no, no. Sp that happened to Spice one. Williams. But, yeah, Sally doesn't remember anything about this movie. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, it's hard to remember back then. But, I mean, I, I guess I do have a funny story, though, because uh -huh. I remember, because I was very free and an artist, and I do remember the girls I had scenes with, you know, the other athlete girls that... Yeah. Um, Christopher, Christopher, Chris Mankiewicz had told me, you, you know, nasty. the girls, like, thought I was a lesbian because I was so open and free and friendly. Yeah. You know, like, dude or whatever. I mean, I was like, well, I don't know. And he said, he said, no, 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 she's the girlfriend of my really good friend. And I thought that was really funny that, that the girls were worried that I was a lesbian with them. And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of those ones that always was so pro women and really like love women. So I mean, I was you know when I went to high school, it was all girls and um, and I you know we were like early early feminists really. So I thought yeah. okay, I I don't mind being con you know uh, thought thought that because I was so friendly that they thought they were a little concerned that I was a lesbian <laughs> with them <laughs> naked in the shower. Um, I thought that was funny. Yeah, Melissa Prophet uh, was in there. She's like a big time agent now, or something like that. Yes, in fact, here's an odd little connection. You know, it's so funny. I always say Hollywood is like a small town. We all are minor oh, yeah. degrees of separation. But Melissa Prophet actually was the man. I think she's a manager. Is she an agent now, but she's the manager. Of, One of the two, um, yeah. Of Marla, who was my co-star on On the Air. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, so you see how she was in the, you, you, it all just sort of, we all sort of uh, work together and then work together again and, you know, mm -hmm. or not or see each other. You know, it's a very, it's a very interesting how it's a little bit of uh, Mayberry community here. Yeah, <laughs> Mayberry, I love it. <laughs> how about uh, Hollywood Zap? Oh, Hollywood Zap. Okay, um, I, I'm trying to remember because they all have different names. That when I start, who was I, all in that? You have to help me remember now. Um, I, Ivan Roth. He's like a, a nerdy guy, you know. Oh, and, yeah. And then Porky oh, yeah. is in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Hollywood Zap. Yeah, that was the one that. Um, uh, I mean, I can't remember the um, official name of it, but. Um, I'm looking at yeah. There, who, there was also. I'm trying to think if that was the one that. Um, what was my role in that? That we. Oh yeah, takes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, that was definitely 
again, this kind of um, sort of artists that go into the entertainment industry type of group of people. You know, there was definitely a lot of creative people um, in that one. So um, I, I'm trying to remember who that who that person was. That, oh yeah, here Don, right? That was yeah, his, like, his girlfriend, right? So. Um, you know, we had like a little, you haven't seen that one, obviously. I saw it back in 1993. <laughs> That's the only time I've seen wow. it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, so again, wasn't I a little punky in that one too, if I recall? Probably. Yeah. I, I have to see the movie again. I, I've only, uh, since then, I've seen the trailer on YouTube, but not the full movie. I'm hoping some someday somebody will upload the full movie. Right. Cause, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of times I really didn't see these movies, but, you know, I can I can definitely remember, you know, working with him and doing the scene. And I had someone else that was, you know, doing a, a an article on me, and he, like, watched everything, and he would go through the really difficult ways of getting all this material. And I'm like, you're going to have to remind me about <laughs> what, what, or tell me what went on and how weird those movies. It, it's really interesting. I love, like, archivists like yourself that mm -hmm. keep all this history alive and really sort of do a deep dive into these moments in um, film history and sort of this crossover time between music and art and um, it, you know it was, it was really alive then this ability for people to make films and come from a real creative background and just try to get it out there you know it's harder and harder now to do that yeah, I mean, these yeah these kind of movies they couldn't be made today, sadly. No, you know. <laughs> no, no, and you know, and on a certain level, there's a lot of like iPhone movies and certain things that do make it, but this particular kind where you're close enough to regular filmmaking but still doing it from a very creative. Um, groundbreaking way, you know, and just yeah. doing it in passion. Yeah, it's really difficult. And I got to acknowledge Ivan. I had him on uh, recently. He's a great guy. Um, also, I love the, the Wizard of Speed and Time. I think that's such an underrated cult movie. Uh, you play a dancer in it. Yes, and that is the one um, uh, I think there was a big dance scene in that one um, and you know that film well right yes so you're gonna have to tell me about that one um, uh, I'm trying so that I can remember because he, honestly all of them had different titles when we were doing them he's yeah Mike Jitlov he he he's a guy who's a screenwriter, aspiring screenwriter in Hollywood, and he can walk really really fast, you know, like 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 a superhero in trance, like you know, from one room to the other. And yeah, he's just trying to get this movie made, and you know, there's a evil gatekeeper, uh, God, a, a famous musician. I can't think of him offhand, but yeah. Um, it's it's a it's it's another cult movie I used to see on USA Up all night when I was a kid. I love that, and so, and and that one was, I mean, it says, when, when there was, the year it came out, it says 1989. 88. 88, yeah, 88, yeah. that was like the same year as Roculus, so in this one, the, the dance, I, it, I think it was actually done earlier, and it took them quite a while to put that one together, is what I can sort of recall, but also, do you, do you remember the big, there was a big dance scene, right? Was there a dance scene? Yeah, there's like a, um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's like a, the, you see, you know, the, the movie being made on set, and it's very elaborate, almost like a stage play, I remember. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it, but yeah, there's there's some dancing going on. Right, right. Um, I'm pretty sure that, I don't know if he talked about that, it took a, a while to actually end up getting it um, done. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've reached out to Mike Jitlov and he hasn't responded to me over the years. You know, hopefully oh, this that's year, interesting. Hopefully this year I'll, I'll get him. Yeah, I mean, I got I got his email from his website and it's a legit email, but I haven't been able to get him. I, I do know it's it started out as like a short film thesis while he was at UCLA in the late seventies, and then it just evolved into a, a theatrical film. Right. 
So, um, you know, I'm looking to see who else is involved in this, how I got in. Because usually I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. I do, I do know Joan Leisman, who was at the Groundling. She's in it. She plays the the wife of the evil gatekeeper. Okay. You know, I'm trying, you know, is, I'm looking at the casting directors because it's like usually I get brought in that way. But I, And I got connected to her from Donna Kaufman. <laughs> that is, you know, I mean, there was a... Donna Kaufman did know Mark, and so yeah. there was, like, a whole um, connection there, but just the actual meeting didn't really happen <laughs> through <laughs> Donna, but I love that she thinks that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I do love Rockula. It's such a canon movie, and... Um, I love United State of Beat. It's a fucking great song. Uh, uh, so how did you get involved with Rockula? Um, so Rockula, um, it's funny, Rockula is a very popular film, and I am very uh, very much have a lot of connection to that movie, so you'll hear. Um, so Rockula, I actually... Um, uh, when I'm trying to think what I, and so when I, I was telling you I was doing uh, a lot of performance art, and so I had the band Visiting Kids, and I was um, qu in quite a lot of magazines at the time, like in the LA Weekly, like every week, and I was in the hip special, um, uh, it, was, it was called Hip Special, it was the Hip Special edition of uh -huh. Interview Magazine, um, it must have been, I'm, I'm trying to remember the year, but it must have been, you know, 87. Mm -hmm. Huey Herman was on the cover, who was a friend. Yep. And um, so there's this beautiful picture of me and the visiting kids um, in Interview Magazine. And Pamela Skye Levy had this picture on her refrigerator, as well as I also was working with Michelle and me and Richard Newton. Michelle and me was a fashion designer at the time, and her husband at the time, Richard Newton, was a performance artist, and I was in a movie called Traction Avenue, and so um, she had pictures of me on her refrigerator, mm -hmm. because you know, she just thought I was a cool girl, and that, you know, she was... She was, uh, at the time, she ended up creating a little company called Juicy Couture, mm -hmm. uh, but at the time she was uh, doing you know, designing hats and different different things, and she was, do, you know, working on um, as a costume designer herself. And she said to her husband, Jeff Levy, um, can you find, can you go and get this girl and put her in your movie, which was Dracula? And Jeff was like, I know Nancy Ferguson. Um, <laughs> you know, Jeff's like, you know, because we, before he was with Pam, he had a band and, um, you know, he had been at UCLA, and so some of the people we had done avant-garde theater dance together, and, you know, we just knew each other because it's all this sort of art, music, um, dance kind of environment that crossed over here in L.A., and I auditioned for the lead part, mm -hmm. and they ended up um, giving me the role of the girlfriend part, which I guess was... You know, there was people like Paul Abdul and different people that were oh, yeah. for, the, for the different for the different parts. So, so the, and Jeff and Pam, Pam and I became best friends. And Jeff and Pam are part of my forever family, my chosen family. So, it all came <laughs> from the start of that movie. And I still see Tawny um, around town. Um, so we re recently ran into each other and. Um, we, the visiting kids are in Rockula, so they wanted to put my band in, so that United State of Beat is me and the visiting kids. Oh yeah, I've 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 reached out to Dean Cameron over the years. That guy is not capable of replying a message without sarcasm. He's never serious. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> and did he go on the show? He's never been on. No, he's just he's always sarcastic. He's never serious. <laughs> That is so funny. I would imagine he would do something like this. Oh, he does he, them all the time. Yeah, but it's just like, what's what's wrong with me? It's like... <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Tom, Tom, well, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so we had um, we had a Rockula, you know, it's got a fan... Um, it's a fan, it's a cult movie. We had a, we had a Rockula reunion um, mm -hmm. that we all did on Zoom 
most everyone was on there. It was so fun. It was such a love fest. And Dean was there, and Thomas Dolby. Thomas Dolby even like that guy's a genius. <laughs> he was incredible, and he played music for us. I mean, we were we had the best time. It was. It, I, I think it. They might have posted it online on that fan base, but we yeah. had the best time being with one another on that uh, reunion Zoom. It might have. I'm pretty sure it was during COVID. So um, it was. It was quite quite a wonderful um, experience. And there was two of the visiting kids that were on there: Autumn and Alex. Yeah. And Scarlett was, I think she had just had a baby and she was in Paris, so uh, it, the time zone she just couldn't quite stay up for. <laughs> yeah. I lo- yeah, I love how he's, you know, throughout the movie, he's talking to his reflection in the mirror. His his, his reflection has a bigger dick than he does. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. There were so many fun things. And yeah, to that, that, there's, that movie lives on and has sort of people are like going, oh, we're talking, you know, the possibility of doing like a live musical show and you know many many things still seem to be kept alive people love that film it usually plays every halloween and yeah. um you know and i you know like i said uh, we we all sort of stay in contact but jeff and pam are you know they're they're my family and uh it, it, it's just a beautiful beautiful thing how it came together you know and and jeff who wrote the film he's on the la- he's on stage you know when we all are playing music at the end he's, mm-hmm. he's he's a great musician and he wrote that song in the united state of beat so yeah we have, we have a lot of fond memories about it in the late season terrell she we became very close during that film and um she was she would in her trailer, she would do her one-woman show for me, and she was another brilliant person. I mean, it was really pretty spectacular group of individuals coming together. Oh, that's great. You play um, Carl Reiner's nurse in The Spirit of 76. What was that like working with him? Oh, uh, wor- working with Carl Reiner? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean... That, that's an historical moment. I mean, Carl, Carl Reiner, working with Carl Reiner, you know, at the same time of working with my my um, ex husband, my husband at the time, Mark Mothers Bond, Jerry, mm-hmm. it was like Devo, Carl Reiner, and me. It was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was oh. Magic. I mean, Carl was, you know, Carl is just incredibly generous his, you know his son directed that movie so and Luca is a great artist and he's doing you know he, he's primarily I don't think he sort of works in film anymore just but he's a wonderful artist and that was again another um really wonderful group of people that came together. I met Sophia Coppola then. She was so young then. She was a costume designer, and her, and her brother Roman was producing, and yeah. Susie Landau. It's like we all see each other through, you know, through the years, and and we were just, it was just, again, another wonderful group of talented people. But, yeah, yep. that working with Carl, you know, what can you say? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, my God, one of the kings of comedy. But... Yeah. What happened to this movie? Like, it had all this talent attached to it. Did it not get, like, a wide release? Yeah, you know, it's the same that happens to many, you know, you don't even, you don't even see all the TV pilots that are so brilliant, um, and they never even get past the light of day that anyone even sees them. But, like, so many movies just don't get the support and they just pick certain ones, and it happens, you know, in music, too. It's like you'll have, you know, a a record label that goes, yeah, we're just going to put all of our money into Madonna, and there could be a hundred Madonnas, but Mm -hmm. they decided it was her. And, yes, she's talented and has a lot of drive and is quite smart in that way, but, you know, there can be these other artists that just never get seen. So... Uh, it's the same in film. Like it, films can get shelved, and not e- and just the people don't want to put the money it takes to go into getting that movie distributed, and they select which ones they want to. Yeah, that, this that's pretty interesting. I so I'm old enough to remember when Phil Collins' "I Wish It Would Rain Down" premiered on MTV. Like, 
I, I remember it so well. And I, I love this video. I've talked to Leland Sklar, the bass player of, of Phil's band, you know, the, the guy with oh, the glasses and beard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great guy. How did, how did you get in this video? Yeah, so I went to an audition for that and got it just you know, by auditioning, and um, what a great, you know, piece of little cinema that way. You know, the idea was just, you know, Phil Collins is a great actor, and I, you know, I got to sit with Eric Clapton all afternoon. <laughs> so, yeah. That, you know, that was pretty fun. That doesn't happen every day. <laughs> I know, all the girls that were doing my makeup and stuff, it's like, Eric is always sitting with you, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. Yeah, I I just love that, you know, old timey backdrop in black and white and Jeffrey Tambor is so damn funny. Nobody can play a louse like him. <laughs> I know. I, I know and you know, Phil Collins is a great actor. Yeah, it's funny. He started out as an actor as a kid, right. and then he kind of fell into being a musician. But he was in the audience of A Hard Day's Night. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, it's been it's been out there for forty years now. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I was I was a kid in there. You could see me in there, and there's a, there's a uh, you know image of it on Google and stuff of him at, at like thirteen there. I love that you saw that music video when it first came out. That's that's incredible. Yeah, because that that definitely, you know, there isn't that many music videos that sort of take that the little acting before seriously like that. Like he really, you know, made sure he did that piece before the music video. It was really well done. People call Michael Jackson the, the king of videos, and there's no doubt that he's he he had some of the best videos ever made. But I think Phil Collins uh, and Tom Petty they tie as like the kings of music videos, in my opinion. Well, I mean, you're not going to be able to have me sit here with without saying uh, actually, Devo is you know by far. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, though they're they're great too. Yes. But, yes. <laughs> but I'm talking about as far as single artists go, you know what I mean? Yeah, single artists, yeah. Well, but then you're going to have to get me because I'm going to have to say David Bowie. <laughs> you know? Bowie's, vi I mean, he did do some good videos, you know, but I mean... <laughs> I they understand because you're like, an, you know, younger, so you're going to be loyal to your, you know, we're always sort of uh, very... Um, I own the best of Bowie on DVD that has all his music videos. <laughs> incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know, he, he's just a, is very, very special and so creative. And um, yeah, those were the ones that sort of led the path for others to be able to work in film and music. So important. So, you know, I, I never, for some reason, I never saw on the air. Um, it wasn't on my radar. You know, I mean, I did see Twin Peaks when it was on, and I and I still love that show, right? But, like, you know, this, this show was never on my, on, on, I mean, it was never on my radar. I've seen clips of it, you know. So, like, you know, how, how was that experience, and how did you get cast in it? So, it, you know, it's so interesting how it all sort of ties together now. So... Um, when the premiere of Rockula, or at least a premiere screening, um, you know, cast and crew screening, let's say, um, happened, uh, uh, Joanna Ray um, was invited, who's David Lynch's casting director. Mm -hmm. And she told me, she thought, you know, I was, I mean, she told me, she thought I was one of the best things in the movie, and I was like, wow. So, you know, Pam and Jeff knew Joanna, and I had sent her then my headshot and resume, and that was that. So when On the Air was looking for the cast, and she was casting it, she tried to find me. I mean, at the time, I didn't have a regular agent. I had just a commercial agent. Mm -hmm. and But I was working on a... A television show that I had developed based on my band um, with Columbia Pictures Television, and I had a hip, I was a hip hop client of Triad, and so she found me and called me in. And when I um, picked up that script and read 
the part and the role whose name is Ruth Trueworthy, I just knew that it was my part. It was like, and every single step along the way became really clear to reveal that to me. So um, she read me, and then for David, because he's so kind, um, he d he can't bear the thought of actors having to go through auditioning because it is it can be kind of painful and torturous. So you just meet with David, and I just explained to him how I saw myself in the role, mm -hmm. and you know um, he it really was down to two people at that point and that he was meeting with because he sort of he almost picks everyone before and Joanna like sort of distills things down for him as well. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that's how that happened. It sort of started with Rockula, and then I had met David before um, with Mark at the Blue Velvet premiere. Uh -huh. I was able to tell him that how knocked out I was by the film, but that how as soon as it was finished, I told him I want to see it again instantly. And, <laughs> um, you know, he was really knew Mark because he had wanted Mark to be in one of his movies at one time, that a film that never got made. Um, and he really wanted to know Mark's opinion because I think David felt after Dune, he was, you know, that was a difficult experience for him. So I He was doomed. <laughs> yeah. And then I was able to meet him. And so when I went and met him for the part, it just, it just, everything sort of lined up. And that was just a dream job. Yeah. You would love the series. It was like, if it was on today, it would be a big hit. You know, because yeah. television is so radically different and people watch so many different types of shows. But trying to fit in David Lynch, an artist, on regular television with commercials, you know, it's, it was, he was so ahead of his time as far as a filmmaker working on television. Now it'd just be like, yeah, we just do it and, you know, it'll have its bizarre audience that loves this, like mm -hmm. these other shows find, and it streams and... It would, it would have a life, but it was a very different time then. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I talked to David Lander before he passed. Um, it was one of my earliest interviews. Uh, he was he was a nice guy. He was a little bitter towards the end, but I can imagine working with him was great at that time. Oh, so Dave, yeah, so David Land, I almost did, all, you know, I always did scenes with David Lander because I was the stage manager of a live television show and he was the director. And David Lander had a language invented by David, you know, where it was sort of all the, like all the vowels were reversed. It was very, um, very funny. It was supposed to be like Eastern European, but it was a very funny language. And I was always interpreting him for the cast. So, um, <laughs> so we had a very, you know, when we, we had an incredible time working together. We had so much fun, the whole cast. But I got to work a lot with David. I knew him well. I actually did a play that I produced and was in with him in it as well. So, um, and I got to see him, you know, up to you know, the, you know, the year, close to the year that he died, as his wife had made a big um, party for him that we all went to before that. And, you know, yeah, David Lander's a very special person. I guess I didn't get to hear the bitterness, but I'm sure um, it oh. happens. Oh, by by that point, I mean his 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 at best wasn't as bad as it was when I talked to him. So I'm sure at, by that point he was very prosperous and just you know working and it's like you know I'm gonna overcome this and all of that you know. But by the time I talked to him, yeah, he just he was he was nice, but just like everything I I asked him, it was negative, you know. Oh, I know. I'm sorry to hear that. You know, yeah. I, I I do think that he got pretty worn down by the um. You know, by the disease. Yeah, I mean, I, I know his wife Kathy as well, and yeah, you, me too. She's a, a sweet lady. Yeah, sweet lady. Just a lovely, lovely, lovely human being on the planet. Yeah, so you know that was a big struggle for them. It, it sure was. And another guest of mine who was on the show is uh, Vanessa Angel. Oh, I love Vanessa. So. 
that she was one of the Welby Snap girls, and I do see her still periodically. So, yeah, yeah. Vanessa is a great person too. Oh yes, her sense of humor is so body, and like I love the way she, you know, she she tortures us men on Instagram with all those revealing pictures. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah, she, yeah, and and I, when when and if you get to see on the air, you know she. She, the the well the Welby Snap girls are the you know she's like a perfect um, person to have that you know it was such a small part of the show but like every single thing that David does is like a big part so they were part of a commercial that was within the live show so they were the you know. Everybody loved the Welby Snap Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the legendary Marvin Kaplan was in there. Wow. <laughs> yes, I know. Marvin was a doll. Um, yeah, he was great. And Miguel, the late Miguel. Um, Miguel Ferrer? Yes. Yeah. You know, who was just, just an, also someone I knew, you know, before I actually did on the air. Um, and the person that I'm in the most contact with that we stayed friends and are like family is Ian Buchanan. Okay. Nice. And yeah, he's a, like a wonderful actor, but his role as Lester Guy was, I mean, you know him in Twin Peaks, but his role as Lester Guy was really hysterical and brilliant and uh, quite something. So, you know, we always say, oh, we're going to be like 90 years old, but remember when we did on the air? We was, you know, we just laughed. So hard. We had so much joy. It was such a great job. Working with David is a dream job. He's just um, a very special person and to me one of the greatest filmmakers of all time and a true artist. Absolutely. And how about Mystery Men? Oh yeah, Mystery Men. So you, you've seen the film? Once, back in uh, 2000. <laughs> Right, so Mark and I, you know, did that opening scene together, mm -hmm. um, you know, which was music and dance, you know, for me and uh, that sort of person. I think we were, I think we sort of create, I believe we sort of created that for Mystery Men, um, that whole scene with the director. So that was, that was pretty fun. That was a really elaborate shoot day, too. Uh, Paul Rubens was also in that. Yes, and so that, and then we were good. We you know we're good friends with the late Paul Rubens, so that was fun. And uh, yeah, that that was that was an incredible cast, and a lot of elements coming together there too. I cried for a week when Paul passed because he just he's he's the reason I love comedy. My my early love of comedy was formed by Pee Wee, and I got to meet him in 2019 at Muster Palooza, and he was just so wonderful. It was worth the two hours and thirty minutes in line, and I got two very bad legs from my car accident, but it was worth it. Oh my goodness! Well, you know. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, Paul is a dear, dear person. Um, I speak of him in present tense because of his people I know that I feel like they're ever present. But Mark and I were very close to him. And, you know, I did not, I saw him but did not know. He was very secretive. Like, neither of us knew uh of his illness, he was very secretive. That's how he wanted it to be. Very few people knew that. Yeah. But um, he was—he's one of the funniest people I have ever known. Like, he, he just makes you laugh every second. You yeah. know, he, yeah. that's just how he is. He is, and he's very generous and sweet and kind to others. Just before it's my turn to meet him, uh, he gets up and he says, I know this is too much information, everybody, but I really have to go to the bathroom. And everyone's like, come on, we've been waiting here. And he's like, okay, 10 more people. <laughs> and then he goes oh back and God. sits down. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm glad you got to meet him. And, um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, it's a privilege and honor to know him as close as I did. I have, it's funny, I had a dream with him last night, so it's interesting you're bringing him up. I had a dream with him last night. Mm -hmm. I always feel like my, you know, people that are no longer with me, they visit me in dreams. But, um, you know, I have lots of, uh, we, we used to do these Christmas 
uh, celebrations together. The late Allie Willis, Mark, myself, Pamela DeBarre. I know Pamela. Yeah. <laughs> right, and 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 um, and Allie's girlfriend Prudence Fenton, and we would. All year long, buy presents for all each person, and, and each person would get like almost twenty presents each. We would do all night long these opening of like really kitsch and unusual things. So I have so many presents he's given me through the years that are very special. Um, <laughs> but just the the celebration we had together, and like, oh no, how do you get that? We want that, you know. Like it was, we were just so funny. We had so much fun. Oh. So what made you get into uh, producing documentaries and stuff? Well, I think that what I realized is the producing actually started a lot earlier. I think I told you when I first, uh, I had the band. Well, so first of all, when you get a degree in art, you're basically a producer. When you do Mm -hmm. performance art, whether it's a painting or it's a piece of performance art, you are creating something from scratch. You have to figure out how to put all the elements together, make your piece, and then you, most of the time in the early days, then you have to figure out how to show it or, you know, if it's performance art, have a venue, whatever. You basically are an instant producer being mm-hmm. an artist. That's just what you do. So as I started finding out about the entertainment industry, don't get to work all the time, and I saw, like, I have these skills, and there are some things I wanted to start getting involved in creating. So when I had the band, um, you know, and I, I produced, you know, the music video, and um, I did a short film, my first short film that I produced and co-directed with Richard Newton. That was like a piece of art. So I started seeing, you know, I had these producing skills, and I told the show my first time out, I told the show to right before on the air to Fox. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had these producing skills, but I, then I got on the air, so it went to pilot, but it didn't get a pilot name, but it went to pilot script. So I started sort of developing these, these producer skills. Mark and I started producing some animation together, and I did some children's programming. And I think I just started getting interested in documentaries and I did some short ones and just like most of my career which is very eclectic things happen organically and my um, we were friends with Robert Williams and Robert Williams called me and asked me to come on board to do a documentary on him that had been started with by these two girls that had been following around and I just took it on and did a feature documentary on yeah. Robert Williams called Robert Williams Mr. Bitchin and then I had this one um, idea because my mom at at uh, 94 when my dad died and she was 94 from 94 to 97 mm-hmm. she told me that she wanted to meet someone so at 97, I just said, okay, I'm going to start a documentary and I'm going to put an online profile for her. And she met someone. So, and then she, that they were together to the end of her life, which was 104 and a half. So the documentary yeah. spans from 94 to 97 and it's called Sue. So, I, you know, it, it was, it's been a very organic experience, you know, becoming a documentary filmmaker. Um, and I always feel like... Hmm. You know, I'm still, you know, now I'm trying to do a docu-series based on that and, um, and that, uh, and, and, and to do a feature film based on that. So it's sort of more about a project that comes to mind and then how do I realize that? Is it, is a feature the best way? Is a short film the best way? Is a documentary is the best way? Is a live the best way is it time to do a painting because that's what I feel like doing so you know I think it's I have a lot of tools now in my toolbox and I haven't I haven't had a traditional trajectory which is single focused so that's how it all evolved wow <clears throat> and you did a, um, a short about a spiritual journey you were on called flying with the angels yes yeah. Yeah. So that one, um, that one was really my uh, an homage to Maya Darren. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but no. Um, so it's she was one of the first. Um, she was a very influential 
filmmaker, part of the Surrealist. So she um, was a Surrealist filmmaker, and when I saw her film Meshes in the Afternoon in college, I said, I, you know, I want to make a film, and I want to, I want that to be my influence. So that was my first. Uh, directing, I co-directed, and it's black and white. It was done on 35 millimeter. It's about 20 minutes long, and you know, went did the festival circuit and won best experimental film in many places. And it really was, you know, doing a work of art and film for me that was sort of very important. And um, it's like I had a story to tell, but I had it to tell in a surreal um, way without any dialogue. Mm-hmm. Was there any nudity in it? Full body nudity. I'm completely nude in it. Okay, I'm going to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, you, you you also produced Bill Rebain's Christmas at Rosemont. Yes. I, I've had uh, Bill on. He's an interesting guy. <laughs> who did you have on? Bill Rebain. Oh, right, right. So, yeah, um, yeah so... Um, uh, so yeah, so that film, um, uh, I came on, um, later, um, because they lost their, um, their cast, uh, in that film, and I was able to bring on board, um, Brad Dwarf and, um, Grace Zabriskie, um, oh, yeah. so, uh, which are two incredible actors, and- She was in Twin Peaks. <laughs> Yeah, part of the whole David Lynch family, so you could see all the connective tissues here. So, yeah. so that is how that sort of film sort of came about. That was like, um, you know, and my producing with that was sort of um, came in when they really, sort of, when the movie was sort of falling apart, or not falling apart, but kind of, because you needed, they needed to put in two major cast roles, and, it, you know, that's where I came on board. Wow. Yeah, I, I had Bill on, and you know he's, he he did the giant spider invasion back in the seventies, which everybody remembers him for. He's done a lot of other good movies too, but um, that one, that 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 one got played on on um, on ABC when they used to have their um, you know Sunday night movie back in the day. It, it's so bizarre because back then you know they 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 were looking for content you know, and then by the eighties they weren't showing movies like that anymore. It was more mainstream. And I remember reading the script and thinking it was a really great script. So, yeah. you know, Grace and Brad really responded to it. So do you have anything upcoming? So the, the thing upcoming is um, uh, I'm going to be pitching soon a, a, a docuseries called Never Too Late, which is based on, basically love on the spectrum for seniors and it would travel through the lives of like 80 and 90 year olds um, for love mm -hmm. um, and you know, a reality type scenario. So um, I was part of the CNN uh, original series, um, docu-series workshop a year ago uh, with Film Independent. They selected 10 projects they felt should be developed to go um, to air and got very encouraged by them and then they felt that I was had that my project very developed but I just need a production company which I have now mm -hmm. um, and an agent so we're about ready to start pitching that so I'm hoping to sell that um, which I think also because it has such a positive message of people finding love at any age and yet still humor and sort of of multi-generations where the grandkids and the kids can all get involved in this sort of um, quest to help someone older in late in life have love. And then um, my mom's story, my mom, Sue Ferguson, who passed last year, her story has also been developed into a feature script that we're hoping to um, get more traction with this year since the writer's strike has stopped. And that is called Never Too Late to the working title right now. So those are my two projects that I am, you know, trying to make and create to fruition. 
Oh, that is so wonderful. That is so awesome. Have you ever thought about writing a memoir? you got such great stories. Oh, boy. You know, a lot of people say I have a book on me, in me, on me. <laughs> that would be interesting. I have one, and I have thought about it, but I'm not a sort of a kiss-and-tell type. But, um, you know, it's funny because Lorraine Newman just, you recently did her, her, you know, her book. Yeah, her Kindle book. Uh. Yeah, and she was saying, oh, you, you know, Nancy, you totally can do it, can do it on your terms and all that. And, um, and I, you know, at some point maybe I will feel like I, I can do that story to be told. But I feel like I'm still very interested in making films and creating art and... I would. I never felt writing was my calling, you know. In all the, you know, I had to write always treatments and certain things. So it's not my calling. But if I worked with someone and we found a real, you know, angle, and I, I do feel like I'm committed to my spiritual path, and I feel like all of these things um, in life sort of reveal that part to you. So if I really felt I had something to impart in that way, it could happen. It could happen still. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think you have great stories, and I think, you know, people would, would love it. I mean, you don't have to kiss and tell, necessarily, but just, you know, get it out there. Like, I was a part of this amazing, you know, underground art world of, um, yeah. you know, uh, film and, you know, performance artistry and all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's true. There's definitely um, a lot of history in my life that is, uh, um, you know, even, you're right, there are so many fun avenues that I could go into that, that would, would be interesting. So it could still, it could still happen. It could still happen. <laughs> awesome. Real quick, we got to play my secret silly game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose is just pure fun. And how the game works is, Nancy, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers because they might be funny. Okay. Nancy, are you ticklish? I am. Tommy, are you ticklish? Yes, but if you tickle me without warning, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a response. I just usually, uh, I have a big reaction, but I've never, I never, I don't have any, I'm a pretty uh, nonviolent person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is your belly button an innie or an outie? It's definitely innie. Uh, Tommy, is your belly button an innie or outie? It is also an innie. Okay, so I guess we go inward then first before we go outward. Yeah, well, it started out as an Audi, and then as I got older, you know, it became in. So do you feel you're more reflective now? Well, it's it's funny because people who have deep innies, they are very generous and caring and kind, and I don't know too much about the, the Audi part, so, you know, maybe it was just fate. Okay. What uh, color are your toenails painted? Um, uh, because I have a, 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 a toe that um, and an iron fell on, they're not currently painted, they're natural and raw because that toenail is trying to, uh, it's created a new toenail that's coming in. But um, my favorite color is very dark, sort of um, deep blue for a toenail. Uh, sorry you're going through that with your toe. It's doing pretty good, though. It's not attractive yet, but it's, it's gonna, I think it's going to come out normal again. Nice, nice. Yeah, right now, mine are not painted, but last time they were, they were gold with sparkles for New Year's Eve. Oh, I like that. Okay. I know, painted toenails are fun. I started painting my toes when I was 13. That's great. Yeah, Jeff Levy paints his toenails usually black. Yeah. <laughs> nice. My mom told me, don't paint your toenails black. It looks so gross, and so I don't do it. <laughs> oh. Oh, um, yeah, I like, I, like, I like the blue. I mean, it's almost like a car blue, you know, that mm -hmm. it's vibrant but dark. Um, yeah. What would you say is your best personality trait? Ooh, okay. My best personality. 
well, I think that I, um, I think that I tend to um, have a very positive outlook on life, and I try to bring that to every single person that I come in contact to try to uplift them and uplift their lives as well. You are very positive. You know, I, I've, I've gotten that from you, you know, mentioning, you know, certain things on here that weren't so positive in my life, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Um, it, it, we, 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 have, we sometimes just have to make um, lemonade out of lemons, you know, as often as we can and try to see that which has been some of the most difficult moments in our life to see how it really does have enormous value and that all the good that comes from it. If you could uh, have anything named after you, what would it be? Ooh. Um, uh, ooh. I could have anything named after me, what would it be? Oh my gosh, this is a difficult one for me. <laughs> um, I went everywhere from um, uh, a Barbie doll to a city to a country. <laughs> I don't know, to like an ice cream cone. I don't, you know, that, I think that if I had anything named after me, I probably would have, would feel it would be an honor. Okay. And then for me, I would like to have a vibrator named after me. Wait, I didn't get to ask you that yet. Oh, my God, but I got the answer. Yeah. Um, okay, so you want a vibrator. Oh, wow, okay. That's not something I would have thought about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a normal guy, Nancy. I'm not a normal guy. You know what? But that's, uh, that's, an, that's interesting. That's an, it definitely very telling. <laughs> yes. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh, um, I don't particularly care for rotten eggs. I don't think anybody does. <laughs> I don't, is there a stinky smell that makes you gag? Either farts or dirty feet. I, I was going to say that vomit is a pretty good one, too. You almost vomit at it at, at, when you smell it. Yes, and yeah, I also don't like hard-boiled eggs. Oh God, awful! <laughs> yeah, so when they're rotten, or even one, one, one degree more. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, thank you so much for coming on today. You are just a national treasure, and you are a very positive person. I, I, th I thank you so much. You brought some ray of light to me today because I lost a really good friend yesterday. She she passed, and I just I've been in shambles. I got very little sleep, but you really oh, did. Oh no! You, well, let's do. What's her name? Her name was Kristen. Kristen. So yeah, you know, that brought tears to my eyes. Let's do a little honor, Kristen, because I do have to tell you, I've lost a lot of really incredible family, dear friends that are like family. Um, and we've lost so many great people, but that, I can't even believe you would have, you didn't need to do this. And, but let's do a little honor of Kristen. And I didn't get to know her, but why don't you tell me a little bit about her so I could share, we can make her very alive in this very moment with us. She was a very funny stand-up comedian that, that I knew for, for years. And she had a couple kids. She had been divorced the last four years and she was raising them on her own and she she caught pneumonia uh, on New Year's Day and she disappeared from social media for a month and then last Saturday you know her kids were on uh, social media saying you know she was on life support and she was going to be be passing away soon and I was like no she's not going to and she did on Monday on Monday like mid-afternoon and just I've been crying ever since. Oh, and how old was she? Just barely 45. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I just want you to know, and Kristen wants you to know, that even though she's not physically here with you anymore, or us, or the planet, and her beautiful children, and all the beautiful people she made laugh, and all the good that she did in the world, that she's within you and she's within us, and she lives there forever, and she's always going to be with you as your angel now. 
Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you so much. You have yourself a great day and be safe out there. Okay, and and um, I, I send you love and healing because I know how hard this is. Thank you. Okay, have a beautiful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Nancy Ferguson, ain't she a sweetheart? She is a national treasure, like I said. Just a wonderful lady, and that was so nice to give me that little prayer at the end for Kristen. Yeah, i just been in shambles, God, the last 24 hours. Also, I forgot to mention at the top of the hour, the Go-Go's are being honored today at the California Hall of Fame Museum. Congrats, ladies. I love you, Gina Shock, two-time guest. And damn it, Kathy Valentine, give me an hour, please. Please, God, can I just get it, Kathy? Please. I know you've been on Marin, but come on. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!